Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of STEM Girls Virtual. My name is Emily, and I'm here on behalf of Cincinnati Museum Center. On this show, we talk about different careers in the STEM fields, those fields being science, technology, engineering, and math. Today, I'm out in the field, so to speak, and we're talking about STEAM. STEAM is science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And we are sitting down in the On Her Shoulders exhibit here at the Museum Center and talking with artist Annie Ruth. Annie and I are currently conducting this interview in her newly opened exhibit, On Her Shoulders, on display in the STEM lab here at the Museum Center. Annie, in addition to being a visual artist, you're also an author and arts educator. What drew you into becoming an artist? Oh my goodness, you know, what drew me into becoming an artist was that I was born with this beautiful gift. Uh, my, my mother always would reinforce that uh, my art was a gift from God and that it was up for me to nurture and, and, and develop. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And yes, uh, anyone who has artistic ability, I am always envious of uh, because it really is, it's an, it's an awesome gift to have. Um, so this exhibit, On Her Shoulders, what's it about? Um, what kind of art is featured in the exhibit? Well, On Her Shoulders actually is an uh, artist commission uh, from Artsway. Uh, it's funded by the City of Cincinnati, Duke Energy, uh, Greater Cincinnati Foundation, uh, and Fifth Third Bank. But it was part of uh, a Truth and Reconciliation during um, 2020, during the COVID pandemic, during um, kind of seeing all the racial atrocities. Uh, they commissioned um, five master artists and kind of put a call out to 27 other grantees um, to create art from their heart. So on her shoulders is a reflective work um, to share the heart and soul of a Black woman, how we process things in life, um, social situations, health situations, uh, and then life in general. Even a chance to really um, present cultural dialogue. So the art is like a springboard to prompt more conversation about learn, just simply build bridges and learn more about each other. So I, uh, I, I created this beautiful logo with, with silhouettes of black women because we have so many diverse perspectives. So on her shoulders, wanted to give people the glimpse of what it feels like. Oftentimes it feels like the weight of the world is on black women's shoulders. And so I wanted to kind of show what that looked like in through art. Yes, thank you. And it it is a beautiful exhibit. So I strongly encourage everyone to come down here and see it next time they're at the museum center. Uh, so you told us a little bit behind the meaning of the exhibit. Could you delve further into the inspiration behind the exhibit? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I grab inspiration from everything around me. I, I am a mother, I'm a grandmother. Um, and, and during the time I was um, creating the exhibit, also to grab lots of inspiration from my mother, because I stand on her shoulders too. So there are several of the pieces that really dive into the healthcare aspects of what my mom went through, and even some of the inspiration. I, I've got one piece in the exhibit that I love. It's called uh, I, I love all the pieces. <laughs> it's the very first piece I uh, produce. It's called I Call Upon the Elders, where I really um, pulled out uh, mixed media and fabrics. And, and, and so you'll see beautiful colors. Um, the unique thing about this particular exhibit is I have a symbol key. So I, I kind of show like at least three areas of symbolism on the signage, but there's so much more. It's like people can view it one day, come back two hours and see something else in, in the artwork. So. I love that. And the generational tie that your artwork is so, somewhat based on in a lot of ways is something I think a lot of us can relate to. We, a lot of us have family stories or photo albums or letters or things that we, you know, cherish as a family. And you have this beautiful artwork that you get to share with Cincinnati as well. So yeah. that's really awesome. Yeah. And how long is the exhibit on display? The, uh, the exhibit's on display through August the 30th. Okay. Um, the, the great thing is it's been open. I've done a gallery talk, lots of um, public programming. And, and there are days that I even randomly pop into the exhibit and just do impromptu tours. Oh, yeah. and, and kind of visiting, kind of looking at the art. Yeah, that's awesome. And there's going to be even more future uh, programs that we're going to share virtually with guests. Some of our story tree times will be around Annie's exhibit. We're going to do a discussion panel on Sunday, August 8th. So please be sure to check back with those as well. 
And um, what do you hope people will walk away with once they've viewed this exhibit? What I really want people to walk away with is a sense of empathy, not sympathy, particularly through throughout some of the, the racial atrocities that, that happened during the pandemic where the world kind of saw firsthand what we as Black people deal with all our lives. You know, when witnessing the, the murder of George Floyd, uh, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, uh, and even the, 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 the guy who was innocently watching birds in Central Park mm -hmm. experienced, um, you know, the attempt of having the police intentionally be used as a weapon against him. You know, we've dealt with those kind of things all our lives. And so what I do is I create these beautiful, bright, colorful pieces that reach multi-generational audiences to draw people in. Mm -hmm. And so to me, you can't draw in, this is an example, you can't draw in bees or, or flies or without something sweet. So mm -hmm. the bright colors are that draw you in, but the ultimate goal is to create dialogue. Let's mm -hmm. talk about this. And what I, I tell people to create dialogue, build bridges but we can't build bridges until we build relationships. Mm -hmm. So the art, of course, is that springboard for building relationships just by having simple um, conversations. Yes, and I, again, these are very difficult topics to talk about. And so having art as a way to introduce those topics maybe into a discussion at a family dinner, or on the drive home, I think is, again, that multi-generational aspect, because yeah. kids have questions. So this, this is a way to maybe introduce some of those topics to them. Yeah. Yeah, you're so right. One of the ones I really love, that I'm actually sitting in front of, which is a really great conversation piece. It's called Cornbread and Collar. Well, who can't talk about food? Everybody, that, that's right. kind of like a universal topic. Everyone can talk about food. So I'm using something as simple as a, a traditional African-American meal was just it. Cornbread, collar, that's the whole meal. So even having a conversation about, you know, why was that the whole meal? How was the meal prepared? Uh, and even in terms of the artwork, when I'm reaching a younger audience, I can dive into things like primary and secondary colors. Mm -hmm. What's a complementary color? So there's so many conversations to have just from one piece of artwork. Right. So Annie, um, I mentioned earlier some of the other programs you're doing with the Museum Center, but I forgot to mention that you're also going to be doing a food science program with us where you're going to talk about your collard greens recipe. Yes, I am doing a great cooking demonstration with the food science department here at the Museum Center. And I'm going to give you a collard green recipe that is second to none. It's an awesome, it's a healthy vegan recipe. Oh, awesome. We're using no meat. Um, uh, throughout the cooking process, I'll talk a little bit about the history of, of cooking collard greens and how that entered into, you know, Black culture as much as, as it has. Um, and then I actually tell people there is a way to cook collard greens adding no water. So oh, you gotta stay tuned yes. to find out how you're going to cook collard greens with no water. Yes, I got to, and I love uh, the, again, another generational tie to it. And food, like you said earlier, is universal. Uh, there's family recipes people have and things. So this is something that people will really relate to. So I'm excited to see that when yeah. it's, once it's out. And that will also be shared virtually on the Museum Center's website and social media pages. Um, and some people might be watching this and thinking, why are we talking about art in a STEM program? But um, there have been many studies about the links to the benefit of art and mental health and well-being. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit. And um, taking part in art, whether it's visiting an art museum, a painting, or just making something has been shown to reduce stress in both adults and children. And now you've done work in the mental health community. Can you speak to some of this work that you've done? Yes, I sh actually, I have, um, I'll share a little personal testimony. Yes, please. To, to kind of guide you into yes. why I went into art um, as a mental health aspect too. As a young mother, uh, my first child was born and he ingested the meconium into his lung. That's actually the first bowel movement that a child has, very black and tarry. Mm -hmm. That got ingested oh, into his no. lung. And so basically the diagnosis was that oh, he would be developmentally delayed. And, and I just, I prayed, I'm a woman of faith, I prayed mm -hmm. and 
also listened to what the doctor said to me. What he said was, my son was so young that there were it, there's so much parts of the brain that we don't use that if I gave him lots of stimulation and I could train other parts of the brain that hadn't been uh, adversely affected to kick in to where, you know, he wouldn't have developmental delay. So I filled his room with bright colors. I sang to him all the time, gave him lots of stimulation. I mean, he got like a total arts experience as, as a child. Uh, needless to say, he is now a 33-year-old uh, father with three sons of his own. Um, on the mental health piece of it, I was the first artist with the uh, Cincinnati Arts Association to develop an arts and healing program. So while I'm not an art therapist, I have been using art to help, um, like I was stationed at a veterans hospital, working with veterans that are dealing with post-traumatic stress, using the art to help them process their thoughts and feelings. And you know, my, my personal testimony about that is my, my own mother, uh, before she passed away, uh, when I was younger, she battled mental illness. One thing that always stood out to me, it was encouraging to me, but it was also healing for her. When I would make my pictures at school and I'd bring them home, it would bring a smile mm -hmm. to her face and she would say, that's pretty baby. So it was uplifting to her spirit and it was as well as encouraging to me as, as a young artist. Too. Right, thank you. And those are some personal stories. So thank you for sharing those. And um, we've you touched on some times of difficulty, but uh, most people do tend to turn to one form of art or another when hard things are happening in their life, uh, 2020 being one of them. Because yeah. I know early in the pandemic, I was reading a lot. I listened to podcasts. I rewatched some of my favorite shows. Uh, why do you think people turn to art, especially in times of hardship, such as the past year has been? Oh God, you, know, I, I, you know, without me being a physician, I do know <sighs> it is so relaxing. I know it does release those endorphins. You just, I mean, there's so much joy um, from it. Uh, for me, it was is is a, a very good way to help process what you're thinking and you're feeling. And one thing I've noticed too is that it's a very non-threatening way to process what you, what you're feeling or thinking. Uh, the colors, the textures, uh, and if, if you're into music, the notes, the vibrancy, mm -hmm. the tempo, uh, they all have a lot to do with how our brain is processing processing that. So. Um, I can't think of a better way. Right. And I think in this past year as well, we, we've shown even more the value of going into the arts mm -hmm. in one form or another. Because again, if people hadn't gone into, you know, writing books or making music, the past year would have been even harder. You know, it's so funny. Even the culinary art. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got in that kitchen and, and, and started creating some, some dishes and became a YouTube sensation. <laughs> color green, but <laughs> yes. No, I, I've watched about your collard greens. It's uh, everyone check it out. Um, and so I've also interviewed others on the show who at some point in their life were told you have to pick a lane. You either you're interested in science, but you're also interested in dance. You have to choose. You can't do both. But um, I think, you know, and they've said since that the arts have shown to help improve math and science skills. So what are your thoughts on the intersectionality of art and the sciences? You know, I, I agree. It, 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 it's definitely intersection um, between the arts and science and art and math. Um, from, I'll give you an example. Even with the math, I'll, I'll dive into the arts and math aspect of it too. From the people who are creating uh, murals, we, we learn things like scaling. Mm. Uh, I think early on, when I can remember when I was a, uh, elementary school student and we would take a cartoon strip and we would draw it almost felt like little all these little boxes on the cartoon strip strip to actually uh, enlarge it they were actually teaching an aspect of, of scaling so they use that for architecture um my goodness i mean even with with the paints and the pigment um mixing um to, to achieve your textures and even um what type of paint that you're using from uh, preparing your fabric uh, to be that gesso, the material that's put on the fabric. Because mm -hmm. for our stretch camp, for folks who are working on stretch canvas, all the stretch canvas is, is cotton that is treated with gesso and stiffened oh. and allows us to, to paint on it. So okay. all, of, all of those topics uh, kind of intersect. 
I love even intersecting um, the art with, with um, literary art too. So mm -hmm. yeah. it's a natural, natural intersection. So, um, Annie, problem solving is something that people face in their everyday lives, and the arts have been shown to help with problem solving. Why do you think that is? The reason I think the arts help with problem solving really is because we are all visual learners. When we, when you, if you think about it, when you are using your imagination, you're not you tapping into your ears, you're tapping into what you're seeing in your mind. And a lot of times what we're seeing in our mind is what we're able to actually write out, even from, from numbers and calculations, is first appearing in our mind in, as a vision image. Yeah, yeah. And um, Annie, if people were interested in learning more about your art, your artwork, books, and arts education, can you share some resources with us? I can. I, you know what? If you Google Annie Ruth, and put, and put a Cincinnati behind it, you get all the uh, media reports and videos. Um, but the simplest way, of course, is to go to AnnieRoot.com, my website. You can actually um, see more about my bio. I've been doing this for 40 years, and I love it. I, I think I'll be probably doing it 40 more plus years. Uh, it, it keeps me young and vibrant and energetic. Uh, people say, gee, how did you tap into the fountain of you? Here's my secret. I tap into the fountain of you through my art and through you, through young people that are uh, in programs like STEM Girl. You all keep me young, vibrant, and using my mind. So remember, AnnieRoof.com, and if you forget that, AnnieRoof Google, mm -hmm. and you get some great videos, uh, song and music, and all the intersections that occur with me as a visual artist poet and a performing artist too. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And we'll share uh, resources within the interview of your website, some videos, things like that, so people can more easily find them as well. And that's then, great. yeah. And then, Annie, my last question for you is, what advice would you give to young women and girls who may be interested in pursuing a career in a STEAM-based field? The best advice I would give to young women and girls uh, pursuing a career in the STEAM-based uh, field is find a mentor and don't be scared to volunteer because volunteer offers you not only the opportunity to serve, but it also offers you the opportunity to hone your craft, your skill and your interest and to get a working knowledge of what it is that you're really trying to accomplish. But typically what I've found out is in, in the uh, mentor aspect of things, if you're willing to volunteer and you're willing to have commitment to whatever you're interested in, there are many people out there that are willing to help you hone and learn more about what you're doing. Oh, that's great advice. Yes, being a mentor or finding a mentor is so important no matter what you wanna do. So thank you. And Annie, thank you for joining us today uh, in your exhibit on her shoulders on display now at the Museum Center until August 30th. Uh, be sure to stop by and thank you all for watching.